brothers and my sisters Only they can understand Fight this war together Together we will stand Hey everybody, it's Joe and thanks for tuning in to TVO Campfire. What this show's about is about successful veterans and they're bringing you the stories and their experiences. And we hope that it can provide inspiration to each of you out there, or maybe a veteran that you know to help in their life. Hey, good morning, everybody. Today we've got Jimmy White. He's a bubblehead, one of my fellow squids, who's done some very great stuff outside of the service. Uh, I'm bringing him on today. Um, I ran into this guy on Clubhouse, he, he captured my attention in about the first 20 minutes that he started speaking. Now, you know, that's going to be a lie because I don't have the attention span for 20 minutes and that first 20 seconds, he got me and I was like, I got to connect with this guy. We talked a little bit afterwards and that's what leads him onto the show today. He's been a great, great voice for veterans. He does a lot of stuff back in his community. That's why he's here today. So Jimmy, welcome, sir. And may, nobody can speak about you better than yourself. Please let us hear it. Now, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the platform. You guys have been amazing. Been following you guys and love what you guys are doing on Clubhouse. And, and can't wait to be a part of this uh, greater community that you guys are building. Yeah, so my name is Jimmy White. I am an Operation Iraqi Freedom Veteran. And the interesting thing about me is that I am a nuclear electrician on submarines, which sounds like super fancy, but really all I did was just like take care of the electrical distribution and make sure that when the cook plugs in the toaster, that it works. So I had to make sure that he was good to go in. As part of Operation Iraqi Freedom, we were actually part of shock and awe. So uh, March 21st, 2003, we shot 20 Tomahawk missiles in support of that effort. And it, it really helped develop me, set me up for the path that I'm on now for my commitment to excellence, commitment to service, and commitment to the veteran community that we have at large. So thank you guys so much for having me here. We're delighted to have you. And it was really exciting to really meet you and hear everything that you were about in Clubhouse, but we got to go back a little bit. How did you decide to go into the Navy and say not, I don't know. Marine Corps. <laughs> so interestingly enough, even though I was a nuclear submariner and literally the Navy put me into two years of school before I went to my first submarine learning nuclear power, physics, chemistry, all that good stuff. Um, I was not very studious in, uh, in high school. Matter of fact, physics was one of those classes that I definitely hooked as much as possible. So when I got out of the high school and I went into college, you know, um, it didn't really work out for me. I didn't have the discipline. Um, I just didn't have the passion for it. So after dropping out of college, not once, but twice, my mother pulled me aside. It's like, Jimmy, you got two choices. You can either join the military or you can go work at McDonald's. And anybody that follows me on Instagram knows I am a foodie. So McDonald's would have fired me very quickly for eating all the food that I was supposed to be giving to the customers. So I said, I guess I'm joining the, the Navy. And luckily enough for me, um, I was smart enough to place into the nuclear power program. But I remember I had the choice of a submarine or an aircraft carrier. And I was like, I'm going on aircraft carriers. Because again, I like food. I also like girls because girls were on aircraft carriers. There weren't girls on submarines at the time. And I wanted to see the world. So I remember going home to my father and I was like, Dad, I'm going to, uh, I just signed up for the Navy and um, I'm going to be on aircraft carriers. And he's like, nope, you're going to be on submarines. And I was like, no, Dad, I'm going on aircraft carriers. I heard they got food like McDonald's there. I'm going there. And he was like, no, because um, he was a Samariner. So he was in the 70s. He was a Samariner. He was a diesel electrician on submarines. He's like, no, you're going to be part of the family. You're going to be part of the bubblehead. You're going to be part of the silent service. Like you're going to join up. And I'll never forget. I, I signed up, went on my first underway um, in 2002 and it was horrible. 
like everything that you can mess up, this sailor messed up. I messed up everything from beginning to end on that time out to sea to the point that the crew was ready to like revolt and like throw me off. And I remember going on a pier and calling my dad. And it was the very first time in my life and the only time in my life that I cursed out my father. I like called him, I was like, you made me join submarines. I can't believe this. This is the worst experience, blah, 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 blah. And then come to find out many years later, you know, after being honor recruit, after three Navy achievement medals, after Operation Iraqi Freedom, our freedom and also being named junior cell of the year for my submarine that I went back to him and said, I, I think you you made you helped me make a good decision. You you did all you did all right, Dad. I'm sorry for cursing you out. Yeah, I, I'll have to admit if you mess up in the aviation community, it'll pretty much eat you alive. So. Oh, eat me alive. But here was the cool part about that, Jeff. It was that you know even though I was messing up, the senior enlisted and the officers saw my work ethic and they saw my potential. So when I was messing up, that affected, literally affected the whole entire crew. So I, I messed up really bad. And the captain got on the 1MC and said that liberty is secured for everybody until we fix Petty Officer White screw up. And literally everybody walked by me with a chip on their shoulder, cursing me out, all this other stuff. And I'll never forget it. One of the chiefs uh, stood up for me. He's like, Petty Officer White, since the second he walked on the submarine, has been busting his butt to get qualified to be a hot runner. Yeah, he's screwing stuff up, but he's been working hard and he's going to be an awesome Samaritan. And like from that day forward, everyone left me alone. Matter of fact, even better, they helped me to get better to be successful. And, and I just had this sense of, you know, community and brotherhood that I really, really missed when I when I got out of the military. But luckily now. I found it in this national veteran community that we have, which has been so, so amazing. Yeah. And, and that's what I, I tell you to me, to me, I, I enjoy and I find it very comical too. how, Oh, we're, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get you. You know, if you, if you do something like in your case, you know, mess something up we're gonna get you yeah you're you're definitely gonna get the attention you deserve but it's gonna be embraced as you know what somebody's giving it the best they got now let's just get them the experience let's get them the knowledge and and let's show them that you know hey it's okay to own up to your own mistakes we're all gonna make them let's just make sure we're making them during peacetime and not during wartime and that's what they did with you that that's truly what they did with you is cool Let's build him up so this doesn't happen in wartime. And that way he can share that with the next person, you know, and just kind of pass on that legacy. And uh, uh, that one thing I love about the military, but yeah, we're, we're to eat, we're, we're going to eat our own, but we're going to eat our own and turn around and build them up. And I'll give you a, a quick, yeah, quick, definitely. a quick story. And that, and where a lot of civilians can't relate to uh, the other day, my family and I are, are sitting at a, at a, a local spot here in Fort Worth. <clears throat> and it's nice because, you know, with COVID, a lot of the restaurants, I don't want to say are completely empty, but we definitely have our space and we get our, 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 uh, our waiters attention very easily, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. so we're sitting around and, couple tables over for me, elderly gentleman, probably in his, gosh, I'm going to say mid eighties to nineties comes in and he's with another gentleman. And the, the first gentleman's wearing that's in probably mid eighties to nineties is wearing an air force hat. And that other guy goes and gets drinks and everything comes back down. They said the other gentleman's sitting at the table. And that other guy, he looks over at him. He goes, he goes, Hey, if you don't hurry up, get over here. And he goes, your food's going to get cold. Your food beat you to the table. You know, he, he just, they just kind of <laughs> jabbing real quick. So I was like, cool. That tells me the guy sitting down at the tables of vet himself on top of the, the elderly gentleman that, you know, is really slow getting to the table. And I looked over at him and I said, sir, I feel really sorry for you. And I heard like forks just dropping like hitting the table like oh no people are putting you know 
and I looked around and everybody's quiet and they're staring at me like, I can't believe this guy's talking to them like that, you know? And I said, I feel really sorry for you because you got to hang out with an Air Force guy. I, I just can't. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and at that time, then all of a sudden the people like around us in the restaurant, you, you start hearing them chuckling and start hearing them laughing and stuff. And, the, and that, uh, that gentleman turned around and looked at me and just tipped his hat. <laughs> he, he just grabbed his hat and he tipped it to me like that and come and yeah, I, as I pretty much assumed after hearing him or, or hearing him talk that, uh, yeah, the, the guy that he was sitting at the table with was an army guy, you know, That's awesome. do, and, and do it's just, wear, do either of you wear your Navy hats or do you think you gotta be like in your sixties or seventies or eighties to wear them and it's, it's interesting that you say that. So I'll, I'll tell you this. When I left the military, I did not identify as a veteran. Like I felt like um, I lost my sense of community and my, my tribe. So for many years, I didn't wear any memorabilia. I didn't, I didn't celebrate Veterans Day. I, you know, even at work, you know, work, they saw my resume and things like that. I said, oh, we want to celebrate you. I'm like, for what? It's like, because you're a veteran. I was like, I am a veteran. I was like, it just didn't dawn on me. But now that I'm part of like this thriving veteran community, um, I, I rock all of my veteran stuff. Like this is my Travis May Foundation, uh, which is a veteran service organization. You know, my Navy, Samariner uh, gear and stuff like that. Like it's, it's cool, <laughs> cool to be able to wear that stuff now because I'm part of the community. But when I didn't feel like I was part of it, you know, it, it was literally collecting dust in, um, in my basement for, you know, almost a decade before I, I really found this community. So that's an amazing question. That's uh, for me. I don't, um, I have, Ooh, I have probably two items from my active duty days. One is a, a hat from when I had to go down to Cuba during the Haiti devastation. Uh, I had to actually live on Guantanamo for about six weeks down there and we showed up and, and now you, so you'll understand the helicopter community that I was in, we never wore our covers at all. Right. Civilian <laughs> side hats, hats. Okay. So here we are, we show up. And we have basically nothing but whatever we could throw in a sea bag because we were the first ones on scene to start helping Haiti. Gotcha. So here it is. We show up. We have no uniform. I mean, well, my unit didn't wear particular standard Navy uniforms other than flight suits and green coveralls. Mm -hmm. And it, matter of fact, Rebecca, it's the same green coveralls that the the Marines have on the uh, for y'all side of the house as far as your aviation guys go so we have green coveralls you know and you look at it doesn't look like we're military at all green coveralls no no you know no covers no anything so we're down there and we need to go to the other side of Guantanamo to go get simple stuff like toothbrushes deodorant you know whatever and so here we are walking around and everybody's like, where's your cover? Where's your cover? <laughs> like, oops, <laughs> that, that kind of got left in Norfolk. Yeah, I did, you know, cause that wasn't our culture to constantly wear those things around because we didn't, we don't wear those coveralls outside the, the gate, you know, and when you're in that gate on the flight line, the cover's just a fought issue. So I ended up having to purchase a, uh, Naval air station, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba hat. And because that is such a rare commodity, you know, not many people get to actually go down there. Right. And so I held on to that. And then when I retired, uh, the, the mess that I was a part of for my, instead, you know, I, I like, look, man, I don't want some plaque, something, you know, I, I don't want to shadow box something that's just going to sit on a wall and collect dust. I'm a very practical guy, you know, something I can use. So they ended up, making me a flight jacket because they knew I would be flying obviously post military career. And then what they did was they put patches from all of my squadrons, all the places I've flown from flown to, you know, et cetera on that. So now when I wear, you can definitely tell when, 
when that flight jacket's on, it's a, it, it's a walk-in historical museum, basically, of my career, and those guys did very, very well for me on that. So, yeah, you know, um, obviously, the brand here, you know, Texas Veterans Outdoors, right um and the more and more that we've became known it's neat seeing you know people come up to you when they see that shirt hey i've heard of you guys boom and they're like so happy you know it's like and then it's like their way of, of, of identifying so yeah i definitely wear you know our obviously our our gear our apparel uh and then the winter months i'll wear my flight jacket but that Cuba hat stays up on the wall. That one very, very rarely gets to make an appearance anywhere. That's awesome. Yeah, we we were very similar. So, um, you know, when I was in in the early two thousands, we wore um, coveralls, blue coveralls below deck on the submarine, and we called them we called them affectionately called them poopy suits. So we wore wore our poopy suits, and they look they were dirty. There was a mess because we were working and doing stuff on on the submarine. But like you, the second you pass, like the uh, for us, the pier or um, outside the gates is like completely frowned on by everybody else in the military community. Active duty military walking around without a cover or walking around in just simple coveralls with like out big insignias and stuff like that was like the super uh, worst thing that you can do on base. You would just look at it like you were unsquared away. You were not squared away. So I can definitely sympathize with that. So Jimmy, how long did you stay in? I did six years. So I, I actually, I signed up in the year 2000. So uh, um, May 1st, uh, 2000 and uh, did two years at Naval Nuclear Power School, learning nuclear power. And then I went to my first submarine, the USS Montpelier. And I stayed with that for four years, um, four years straight until 2000. And six, and it, it was it was just like one of the most amazing experiences. It was it was a challenge to to say the least, but you know to be able to be around that sense of excellence and and people that were striving to be the best they could possibly be in everything that we did, it was just it was just an amazing time frame. It's, it's crazy now because you know I've, I've been out for so long, but those memories are so vivid and so fresh. Um, it, it just, it just comes out. Yeah, de definitely, man. Definitely. And what's neat is that you about this show is people can look and they can see it in your face right now. They can see it in your eyes as you're talking. You still have that. You still have that glare. You still have that, that happiness. You still have that boom that it was such a good positive impact on your life, man. And, and I like that you were able to pull off Jay Soy, uh, the junior sailor of the year, because that right there in itself speaks volumes. That means, and for those of you that don't know, basically Jimmy, uh, what E4 at the time when you got Jay yep. Soy. So, mm -hmm. um, Jim, Jimmy ended up being voted as the top E4 on that entire um, what they refer to as a boat, really, it's right. submarine, you know, but <laughs> like he, he was the top E4 on the boat, which is basically, he's learning junior leadership, and he's developing his leadership skills, and he stood out amongst his peers to be the number one performer doing that. And that speaks volumes when the guys voting on you are 12 and 14 and 16 year folks that are saying, hey, this is the next up and comer. This is the next one. So congratulations for that, Jimmy. Um, you know, it, I, I look. It's one of the coolest moments of, of my naval career. And, and really because I was able to celebrate it with my mother and my father. So um, in just the way the context you put it, being selected by the people that you, like not the leadership team, the high up leadership team, but being selected by those that are around you in the trenches with you day to day, like meant so much. So when I when I won uh, Junior Cell of the Year, I actually was able to compete in the regional competition as well up in Groton, Connecticut. And we're up in Groton and my father is a mariner. He comes up, my mother uh, comes up and we have, in my, in my wife at the time, who was actually my fiance, we had this amazing trip. I mean, literally, 
we were at the VFW with all these submarine exchanges and stuff like that. And my mother and father are like working the bar, celebrating, like they're the life of the party. And it was like the most amazing event. But unfortunately that wound up being my last trip with my mother. My mother wound up passing away about a month later and really affected me because the very last conversation that we had, like in depth, important conversation, we was at that award ceremony. And she pulled me aside and she said, Jimmy, you got a year of service left after you win, won this award, what are you gonna do? And I was like, I don't know, this kind of sets you up for advancing really fast when you win these type of awards. And um, you know, I miss home, but I, I really wanna be the best I can be, but I, I, I really don't know. And she said, when you make the decision to come home, come home and do work. And, and that's all I remember, come home and do work. You know, she passed away and we talked a little bit about you know, our memorabilia and stuff like that. I remember coming to the funeral and, you know, I had this, you know, big, all this chest candy, all these medals and stuff that I have. And I remember taking them off and laying them in her casket and then telling everybody that everything that I accomplished in the military, none of it would have happened if my mother hadn't lead me and guide me into military service. So those weren't my medals, those were her medals. Um, but I wound up getting out a year later and coming back to the greater Philadelphia area where I originally grew up at. And you know what? I didn't do the work. I didn't do what she asked me to do. I did it in the corporate sense. So like the same way I excelled on the submarine, I excelled in corporate America. I literally, I went from operating a nuclear reactor to going into property management, changing out toilet seats for a living. Um, and I did that for quite some time, but every year is like I was promoted from a technician to a, a electrician to a supervisor to a operation manager. And then before I left that company, I was actually their global operation manager handling domestic and international property for a large Fortune 500 company. And I did that within you know ten years. And my military service was the what propelled me to understand craftsmanship, ownership, professionalism, so that it just carried over unbelievably to my career. But I always had this hole, like I was always missing something. And it wasn't until about 10, 12 years later when I, um, I read the book Brothers Forever, which was about Travis Mannion and his best friend Brandon Looney's life. And it got to a point where it said, um, Brandon, before he went on his final, I mean, uh, Travis, before he went on his final deployment and unfortunately uh, passed away, um, he said, you know, if not me, then who? If I don't go and serve my unit, who would go in my place? It wouldn't be someone that knows what I, knows the, the unit, knows the language, knows our strategies and what we do. And he violently um, save a couple of his fellow Marines um, and unfortunately succumbed to the injuries. But he that motto like stuck with me. And then that moment, the second I read that line, I realized I'm doing the work in corporate America, but I'm not doing the work that my mother sent me home to do in my community. And from there on, I've decided that I want to be a youth and veteran advocate making an impact locally, but now even more so, I've been able to do some stuff nationally that's just been like super amazing. But it, it, it really pulled from that background, from my time in the service, my mother's calling on my life, and then this mantra, uh, if not me, then who, that I live out every single day. All of that had to culminate together though, to really build the foundation to do that work. Oh, totally agree. Like I couldn't, like do, do, I had to deal with the mess to get to the part where I could do everything else. You know, life is a journey. Life is a, a, a process. And um, look, Joe was talking earlier about, you know, the pride that I have of being a Samariner. You know, there were some crappy days as a Samariner as well. But all those things uh, together built the character that I have today. And luckily enough, I'm able to get some platforms and do some things where I can put that character into action, but even more so build character in the future leaders of our nation, our young people, and show other veterans that you can use the character and skills that you learned in your time in the military right now in our civilian world. We need veteran leaders. We need veterans to show up. We need 
We need veteran politicians. We need veteran teachers. We need veteran doctors. We need these veterans with this character that they built in their time in the military to show it to the civilian world and said, service means sacrifice. And this is just another way for me to continue serving. Absolutely, man. Uh, I, I can't by, by any means argue with one thing that you just said. As much as I, I want to get, I want to argue with a submariner. <laughs> I, 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 I can't, man. It, it's because you're, you're hitting it. You're hit, you're hitting the points where other people are failing and they're wondering why they're failing in, at those things. And you just hit the simple, to me, it's simple. All you, all you got to do is do what you're taught. That's it. Do what you're taught while you're in and you will not only succeed in the civilian sector, but you will literally start cakewalking people. Oh, yes. It, and I, I, I don't know, I don't know other, uh, any other way to talk to them blue in the face <laughs> and, then, and then this show as well. It's like say it over and over and over again. If you just do what you were taught while you're on active duty, you will be very successful in the civilian sector side of the side of the house. Now you're going to have to Kurt tell your attitude a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to fine tune. You're going to mm -hmm. have to fine tune and polish that thing up a little bit, you know. But uh, yeah, Jack, Jacko calls it uh, playing the game. So you got to know when to play the game to get to the next level. But it's interesting. Real quick story. I, I went to a, um, a veteran center in the greater Philadelphia area and they asked me to come speak to them and um, about what I do with the Travis Manning Foundation and hopefully encourage other veterans to get involved. And there was Korean War veterans, Vietnam veterans, Desert Storm veterans there. You know, it was a, it was a veteran center. So they were some of our older veterans and they had the VA speak before me. They had the National Cemetery Program and they were telling them these things like, Make sure you have your DD-214 on you when you pass away. Make sure that, um, you know, all your things are lined up for when you die. And, and all these things, and I, I was so struck by it that when I got up to speak, I said, look, I'm not going to tell you how to die. But what I will tell you to do is how to live. And we need your stories. We need your character. We need your leadership in the communities today. So let me tell you how you can get in front of a, a class of young kids and tell them about your time in Vietnam and how you overcome in your perseverance so they can persevere a pandemic. If, they, if I can persevere war, they can persevere a pandemic. It takes that same resiliency, that same character, you know, just, just and, and give them the opportunity that, look, we don't want you to think you're washing away and put to a side. No, we want you on the front lines right here with us because you are valuable. You are important. Lead with your strengths that you build in your time in the military. And with, with that, Jimmy, tell everybody what it is you're doing right now at this point in your life. You know, so right now I am a um, youth and veteran advocate. I'm also a public speaker. And my goal is to go in front of as many people as possible to encourage them to live out their life blueprint, to um, build on their character and to be the best them that they can possibly be. Um, May 15th, I'll actually be doing a TEDx here in the greater Philadelphia region, specifically about living a life of purpose and having a blueprint. And then last but not least, I was just part of this amazing Veteran Voices program that was produced by Poetic Theater in New York. But it was a virtual program where veterans from all across the country were able to do a writing workshop where we wrote about our experiences, wrote about our purpose, and was able to fine tune them and adjust them. And we just had uh, our final performance yesterday. But the program needs more funding. There'll be some videos and stuff that comes out. So if you get a chance, go check out Poetic Theater on Instagram or Facebook or on their website and look up Veteran Voices. It's an amazing program. And if there's any veterans that want to get part of this community, it's an awesome program that they can be a part of. Awesome. And what do you, is literally, let's say, let's look at it at a, let's go at a 10 year. Let's take at a, a 10 year look down the road for you. Where do you truly want to be with your life in 10 years? I, I love that because that fits so well with my message of your life blueprint. So 
right now I'm trying to be a servant leader, but my goal is for the next five and 10 years is to build this legacy of empowering others towards your goal, towards your plan and, and building something that will outlive me. You know, um, as a Samariner, you know, we, we pass the mantle on to the next crew that comes behind us and next other. I wanna make sure that the next generation is set up for success. And they say that your name, you die two deaths. You die one where you naturally pass away. The other one is when people stop saying your name. Um, I want them to say my name in good lights and to be part of a legacy of building future leaders for our nation. That's, man, I, mic drop <laughs> right there. There you go. Drop it on them. Well, thanks, man, for giving us a, some of your time today. And you you probably don't know it yet, but you are lucky number 13. You <laughs> are the season finale of season oh, wow. one for our show so uh episode number three just happened to be a bobblehead guy by the name <laughs> of steve schultz oh dope. Uh, yeah he was he ended up uh i think he was cob honestly oh, cool. but he was he was yeah he was he's he's a master chief um ended up doing very very well for himself uh and then left the bubblehead community went into aviation and just kind of rocked their worlds as awesome. uh, as as well and uh if you take a look at episode three with steve schultz and and see what he's doing now in the civilian side of the house and the the, the guy is single-handedly changing companies as, as a contractor they bring him in to actually teach him to to coach and teach their executive level managers and so literally this one guy is walking in and and single-handedly turning companies upside down with culture and everything so i, I love so, that i'll definitely connect with them and since this is your guys season finale thank you thank you thank you guys so much for this platform that you guys have created i, I i'll let you know right now just just the act of me being here with you guys i feel empowered but I can tell you that there's other people that were watching these episodes, watching these shows and being a part of your guys' program, that you guys are changing the narrative that we have in our veteran community right now. So please continue to do the work. You guys are amazing. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I wanna thank you, Jimmy, for being with us today. And I wanna thank all of you for tuning in to Texas Veterans Outdoor at TVO Campfire for especially today. Today has been a really exciting day for us as we wrap up our season and what an exciting episode that we have had. We also want to encourage you to share all of this with other veterans. We want to encourage you if you yourself have a success story and you're a veteran or if you know other veterans with success stories to get in touch with us because we want to magnify you and of course ensure that you get your stories heard. Please get this out to as many veterans as you can across social media and other venues and join us also on Wednesday nights on Clubhouse. We look forward to bringing you part of our veterans community because we all are part of the brother and sisterhood of veterans. So thanks for tuning in and thanks for watching season one. We'll be with you with season two pretty soon. Well, we're veterans, so we spend a lot of time in mental health. Um, <laughs> thanks for telling me. That's part of it, right? And uh, so, and we also teach a class called, uh, now it's called Rec for Heroes. It's a guitar class at the VA, uh, Fort Worth VA. And I've been teaching now for now five years and, and Ron has been helping me teach the disabled vets up there. And um, so I said, I got to thinking, you know what? The song is essentially three minutes with your therapist, right? I mean, it can make you up, make you down, whatever. So I uh, wrote a little bit about it and Ron is like, yeah, let's finish that sucker. Yeah, so, we sit down and it's called finished, three minutes. Of, and we finished it in a thunderstorm. Yeah, that's so. right. Give me a three-minute session. 
Read my favorite Haggard song. Warm summer evening and the rumble of a storm. Find my direction, way to heal my wrongs. With a three minute session in the form of a country song. Now, therapists, they try their best. In the form of a country song. 